Well, I've been nope. here with you. No, we're never ready. Home, I know. Michael's just nothing. There we go. There we go. Trout's getting it. You got Dennis in it. That's good. Now we're good. Make a joyful. praises, Lord, entering in with thanksgiving, with praises, just thankful for all that you've provided, Lord, for all that you continue to do. We just want to continue to worship you now. Speak to our hearts and be with anyone who might be on their way, Lord, just set apart this time that we might focus on you. Give thanks to the Lord.
Father, just as we come with thanksgiving, with praise, we ask that we continue to worship you now, to thank you through the reading of your word, Lord, that we would just worship and praise and adore you as we open your word to our hearts. We ask that you open our hearts to your word and teach us by your spirit, Lord. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts that would open up and receive everything you have for us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen and amen. amen. I want to click that record in there just for just for the records on the in that row computer and that way we don't know if we'll be able to use them or not any one day maybe in the archives of life when we're out of here there will be something in the library there. For those that are for those who still here. Still see it. Yeah. Those who are left behind, yeah. So JD from Hawaii, from Calvary Chapel, Hawaii, did a prophecy update today, and it was focused on the rapture. So oh, nice. we really good. Oh, I bet it was. Nice. Yeah. Did a big one, but yeah. It's called um, On the Brink. And he said, we're on the brink of getting out of here. And they're on the brink of everything just exploding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we we uh, finished Second Chronicles. Well, Dad finished Second Chronicles last week. Um, I think he did. <laughs> yeah, he did. And the chat, the uh, last verse of Second Chronicles. Gets us set, sets us up right into Ezra, um, twenty verse twenty three of Second Chronicles thirty six. Uh, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Now in the first year of that same king, Cyrus, king of Persia, Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, by the mouth, uh, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up this, the spirit of this king, Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made... A proclamation, that is King Cyrus of Persia, made this proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith King Cyrus of Persia, The Lord God of heaven give, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem, and whosoever remains in any place where he sojourneth, um, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts and beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem and all, that, uh, and all they that were about them strengthened their hands or encouraged them with vessels of silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts and precious things besides uh, beside all that uh, was willingly offered, and also king, uh, Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth um, out of Jerusalem, and had put them in the house of his gods, even those did Cyrus king of Persia bring forth by the hand of 
Mithredith, <laughs> Mithredith uh, the treasurer, and numbered them unto Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them, 30 chargers of gold and thousand charges, a thousand chargers of silver, platters of silver, nine and twenty, twenty-nine knives, thirty basins of gold, silver basins of a uh, second sort, four hundred and ten, and other vessels, uh, a thousand. All the vessels of gold and of silver were five thousand and four hundred. Um, all these did Shesh, Sheshbazar uh, bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. So who wrote this book? Anybody? Ezra. Ezra. <laughs> the big bold letters, right? <laughs> when we start a new book, it's, it's always good to review, always good to come back to our basics. Who wrote the book? Ezra. To whom was the book written to? This was to, written to those who came out of Babylonian captivity uh, right around 540 or 538 B.C. was when they would be coming out of the Babylonian captivity. Um, what is this book all about? We're going to see instructions for godly living. And more... Uh, more uh, specifically, rebuilding, um, coming back to God's Word. Other books that Ezra most likely wrote was First and Second Chronicles, the, and I think I mentioned that when we started the Book of Chronicles, and the, and there were no, it was just a whole long book. It was no first and seconds, and so without. Uh, Ezra, much of the history of Israel would be uh, tarnished, especially Judah, the history of Judah, which Chronicles uh, hones in on, zones in on. With just uh, First and Second Kings, you get a lot of scattered info, and kings you just don't really care to know a whole lot about um, because of how wicked they were. Not that we, we can learn much from the book of Ezra also has instructions for godly living, what it's all about, but it's instructions for a nation. This can be an inst a book of instructions for any nation that would come and take, take, uh, take into account. Um, when was this book written? <coughs> A lot, a lot of, uh, I still haven't gotten to ask Dad. He knows exactly when it was written, but <laughs> most likely. It was May of 536 BC. No, no, four, uh, 450 BC, because the, the captivity they came out of was 538. Yeah, but he didn't sit down after he died until May. It says 536. Yeah. Does it say 536? Mm -hmm. Well... Yeah. That's With a wrong. Question mark. Okay. It also in mine it says author unknown. Um, and mine does too. Yeah. So. Well, mine says uncertain. Uncertain, unknown. But, but. I wrote flip, Ezra. In mine. Paul wrote it in mine. Oh, you wrote it in yours. So the reason, one of the reasons, actually, it's it's important to jot this down is next to who who wrote the book. You could put Ezra, Ezra chapter seven verse ten. I love this. Um, this actually is the verse that wanted me that that uh, convinced I should say Jess to name our boy Ezra. Uh, Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Also, back up to verse six. I think Ezra chapter seven verse six. Ezra went up from Babylon, he was one who was in captivity, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given, and the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord is his God upon him. So Ezra was a scribe, according to chapter 7, verse 6. So that's 
where Pastor Chuck, <laughs> where me and Dad get the that this most likely was Ezra, and also where you kind of get the the uh, the feeling that he had written First and Second Chronicles with the way that Second Chronicles ends. It's uh, that's one of the reasons I read the last verse of Second Chronicles. It starts the same way that um, the book of Ezra starts. So, but to be someone who's ready with the pen, back in those days, it was rare to know how to write, to know how to read, to be a scribe. It was something very rare. It was a gift from the Lord. And the hand of God, the hand of the Lord was on Ezra. I pray that the hand of the Lord will be on my little Ezra like like he was on this Ezra. Protect him and strengthen him. I already him. laid hands on him a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but that's, and, and what Ezra, uh, the book of Ezra, we're going to see is um, very important. Why is this book so important? That's the who, the what, the when. Why is this book so important? Ezra gives us an account of a very um, crucial point in Israel's history. These uh, 70 years of captivity. In fact, uh, the prophecy that's being fulfilled, verse 1, Ezra 1.1, 1, 1, we're told that there's a prophecy that's being fulfilled by the mouth that was by the mouth of Jeremiah is is found in Jeremiah 25, um, and it's it specifically mentions in Jeremiah 20, 25, 11. Shoot over to there. This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. That's Jeremiah 25, 11. Um, Daniel, <laughs> and I mentioned this this morning, Ezra causes you to go to the book of Daniel. Daniel would have, and, and we know from Daniel chapter, let's see if I wrote this one down. Um, Daniel read what we just read, Jeremiah 25, 11, um, and knew that they would be coming out of captivity at the 70 years that Jeremiah just said. They would be in Babylon serving the king of Babylon for 70 years. Um, Maybe it's Daniel 2.20. No, that's not it. Anyways. <laughs> um, historian uh, Josephus writes about Daniel uh, speaking to Cyrus, probably in his 90s, 90 years old, maybe older, Daniel, uh, when he was brought, when he was taken into captivity, Daniel, by Babylon, he was in his teens. He was 16 around there. So nine, 70 years later, he's, he's approaching 90. He's a, a little over 90. And uh, he uh, would speak, and, and this is pretty cool. He would come to Cyrus and show Cyrus his name in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 44, um, this Cyrus, king of Persia, is mentioned by name by the prophet Isaiah, 44 verse 28. Um, this is all just really incredible stuff when you realize how God's word comes to pass. The title of my message tonight uh, came from this. Um, well, it comes from this whole idea, but... Uh, that in Isaiah 44, verse 28, it says, uh, that saith uh, Cyrus, of Cyrus, 
He, this is God speaking of Cyrus, He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be a, a built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord, verse, uh, this is Isaiah 45, verse 1, to his anointed. Now he calls Cyrus his anointed. Uh, Isaiah 45, verse 1. Uh, it, whose right hand I have, I am holding his right hand to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings <laughs> to open him before him the two leaves gates. Uh, the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of uh, hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I the Lord will which call thee by thy name Cyrus am the God of Israel for Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect I have called I have even called thee by thy name I have surnamed thee though thou hast not known me that's incredible and what's the title of the message? I forget. I wrote it down. That's what, in a in a sense, in a sense, that's what God is saying to Cyrus. You don't know me, but I know you. And it was what two hundred years. A hundred and yeah, over a hundred and fifty years. I think hundred and seventy-five years before Cyrus was even born. God knows you. God knows. And actually the, the prophecy, Jeremiah 29, 11, 29, 10, and 11, in that context, he's talking about this very thing, that though they be in Babylon, there's a plan. We see that Jeremiah 29, 11 on coffee mugs and taken. A lot of people don't realize the context in which it's taken is them being in captivity for 70 years and God saying, I know the plans I have for you. Plans that are good, that, that you will prosper. You're going to come back into a land that was desolate, that was just completely ruined. The temple has been burned. Um, the people have been taken away. What's the reason for all of this? Um, <laughs> what is the reason that God would, would cause them to be captured? Well, there's quite a few. <laughs> And idolatry is a big one. That's the big one, I should say. We just looked at with with uh, Chronicles. Um, all of the kings that would bring them right back into e idolatry over and over again. But the big one is they didn't keep Leviticus 25, 1 through 7. In Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 through 7, we're told about a Sabbath year. This blows my mind. God wanted them to rest, to not do anything to the land, do not toy, uh, break up the dirt, do not plant anything, do not work on that land. Give the land a whole year of rest. Can you imagine God saying, don't do anything for a whole year. Take, take it easy, kick back. This is, this is my year. People can't even do that with one day, can they? They have a hard time setting aside and saying, I got to get to church. I got to get to fellowship. Now, we, I try and do it at least three times a week, more if I can. And that's fighting a battle to make that happen. But here, God says, you're going to give me those 70 years that you... Because for 490 years, they did not do this. They had done it in the past, but for exactly 490 years, they had not done it. They had not kept that year. And God said, no, I, those are my years. They're accounted for. God's perfect just. 
He's perfect, perfect in justice. He keeps track perfectly. <laughs> and 70 years they would be in captivity. He says, you want to be idol worshipers? I'll take you to the epicenter, Babylon, mm -hmm. of idol worship. Is it no wonder? That's where they were for 70 years. It's God does that with you, does that with me. Gives you over, says you take your fill of it. You like that stuff so much. Just do it until it makes you sick. That's what he did with me. Maybe he didn't do that with you yet. But. <laughs> you want to you choose a lifestyle in, in doing that and pursuing that? Go for it. It'll make you sick. Hopefully it doesn't take you 70 years before you realize. <laughs> but God does that. And the other interesting thing about 70 years, that's how long a lifetime is. In the psalmist writes, 70 years a generation can be that long. Is God trying to, to uh, get something across to his people? You know, here you wasted a whole lifetime of just, oh, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I can't do it. We can't do it. We can make money if we just toil the ground and do that's That's foolishness. The cross, the preaching of the cross is what? Foolishness to those who are perishing. God is in control. That's another thing that becomes blatantly clear with um, Cyrus. Even though Cyrus is a wicked guy, he's godless, he's out there, um, God's going to take him. Uh, Proverbs 21, verse 1, comes to life with Cyrus. What does Proverbs 21, 1 say? I didn't read Proverbs today. I mean, you know. you got to read it. Oh, right? I told you. Proverbs 21, 1, you guys all know it. <laughs> the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it. I like it because verse 1 says, The Lord stirred up the heart of the spirit of Cyrus. Proverbs 21.1, the Lord stirs the king, uh, turns it whithersoever, wherever he wants, like waters, just turns it wherever. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, another good one. He sets up kings, he removes kings. These uh, elections must be a comedy to the Lord. He knows the outcome. And we're just, oh, you got to get through that. Da, da, da. Not that we shouldn't pray, we shouldn't do our part, but, but no, you know God uses someone like Cyrus. His, his will will be accomplished, amen? amen. His will will be, um, will come to pass. Um, Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, that's where we learn that Daniel read Jeremiah. That's a, that was a neat one, because uh, it says Daniel knew from, from reading Jeremiah. He read, and, and we too need to get familiar with these things. So chapter 2, before we go on here, um, well, one thing to note too, is that um, uh, King Cyrus, king of Persia, left it up to them. A free will kind of a thing. They didn't have to leave. And that becomes clear because those who would, be, would leave behind, verse 4, Ezra chapter 1, verse 4, those who would, whosoever remaineth, in any place where he sojourns, let the, man, let the men of his place help him with silver, with gold, and, and with uh, animals, uh, beside the free will offering of, for the house of God. Um, and even Ezra, or Cyrus himself, the, the king, brought forth gifts, vessels. The, these people were going on a journey. Um, it's something like a six-month journey from Persia, where Cyrus was king, 
to where they were going, they were given uh, the freedom, the proclamation was made that they would, uh, basically King, uh, King Cyrus is allowing the Jews to return home. But that home is some, I think it's 900 miles, <laughs> something like that, from uh, a six month journey. It's not, it's, it's not something easy to just, and when the Lord calls you to, to do something, especially go, go back, get back to the Word, get back to your first love, it's never easy. Man, Babylon, by the way, you could make big money in Babylon. And most likely, many of these people were comfortably, uh, comfortable, and, and yeah, they were in uh, bondage, they were being held there, but for 70 years you start to get comfortable, don't you? Even though you're a slave to sin, we see it all over. We, we can do that ourselves. Be, be a slave, and we get so comfortable in the, in the slavery, in the bondage of sin. Um, and so God calls them out, God provides a way, some of you aren't going. Well, guess what? If you're not going, it ain't free. You're going to send them with gifts, with provisions, with animals. With You're going to help in some way. This is, By the way, this is where we get that idea of missionary work. Where, yeah, we've never been to uh, China, or we've never been to Africa. We've never been to um, all these different places. But we've sent missionaries and we send support for missionaries. Bigger than money and supplies is prayers. Amen? That's what they need. Your prayers go with them. But these guys would cough up and, and it was a decree that was given. Um, I like what... Uh, I think it was Pastor Chuck got from... Verse 4 through 6 there. <laughs> Very simply put, it was go or give. <laughs> you could go and be a part of the work of the, that the Lord's going to be doing. Be a part of this rebuilding project that's going to be taking place. Or you could give. And the same command reply, applies today. So, they were, they were called to either go or give. Um... And so, uh, Cyrus gives them great gifts. Uh, and now we have the prince of Judah, Sheshbazar, Shesh, uh, a pretty bizarre name. Huh? Um, his name means, Sheshbazar, his name means joy in affliction. That was my second name after Ezra was Sheshbazar. <laughs> But we're going to learn that Shesh Bazar is the same guy in chapter 2. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Now these are the children of the province that went out of the captivity of those which had been carried away, uh, whom Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king of Babylon, had carried away into Babylon and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, everyone unto his own city, which came with Zerubbabel. There he is. Now you're going to, in Persia, just like in the story of Daniel, what was Daniel's name? Do you remember? In the book of Daniel, Belt Shazar. A lot like Shesh Bazar. <laughs> Shesh Bazar. Um, the, they, they changed their name. I forget what Meshach, Shadrach, and Midigo's Hebrew names were. Right. But they were not. Those. Which I always said we always should know. We them. always should know yeah, their yeah, Hebrew yeah. names. But that's what they did. It was, a, it was kind of a cultural thing. If you came in, and if you were uh, being brought in in captivity, you were called whatever they called it. You know, mm -hmm. you didn't have any say in what they called you. So this Shesh Bazar, but his name's interesting that it means joy in affliction. And then you get to Zerubbabel, whose name means, uh, it can either mean sown in Babylon, or I like stranger in Babylon. Uh, that's Zerubbabel, 
what his name means. Also, by the way, Ezra, his name uh, means God helps or Jehovah helps. And I'm just still praying for the help in our family. I <laughs> thought I all how I had to do was name him, but <laughs> so joy in, aff in affliction and a stranger or sown in Babylon. Um, and uh, Zerubbabel is the grandson of Jehoiachin, <laughs> who's at the end of I think it's second it's uh, thirty six. The Second Chronicles 36, 9, uh, the last chapter, if you look, you have Jehoiachin, the, one of the last kings in Judah. This is his grandson, Zerubbabel, who was taken into captivity. Now he's going to be leading the people. Also, another neat note about Zerubbabel or, or Sheshbazar, however you want to remember him. I like Zerubbabel. Uh, He's the one, when you get to Zechariah, right around chapter 4, who we, again, another coffee mug verse, not by might nor power, but by my spirit. This, this is this guy, Zerubbabel, who states that, who, who knows that, who comes to realize it's nothing I can do. This is all by the Spirit of God. Uh, and I like... Um, of course, another one of my kids, Je Yeshua, Joshua, the high priest, is, is right there, right after verse 2, chapter 2, Ezra, chap uh, chapter 2, verse 2, Zerubbabel, Joshua, is the high priest who comes, and again, they're both, they both show up in Zechariah um, during uh, this time, during about, about this time. Uh, Nehemiah, we're going to get to him next in a year or so from now, right? No. Mordecai. Um, is that the same Mordecai? I'm honestly asking. I don't know if it is or not. But of uh, Esther. The, the story of Esther. I just, I don't know. Maybe it is. Another interesting thing, too, is that <clears throat> Esther, the whole story takes place where? Jerusalem. Persia. Not Persia. <laughs> Esther. So, so we're getting set up to this. Um, we're getting set up for that story uh, in, in Esther. Uh, and it's, it's really fascinating. But you have a list of those who came out of the 70 years of captivity in Babylon. That's chapter 2. This long, long list, and don't worry, we're not going to try to pronounce any of these names, but <laughs> you have uh, all of the priests, um, and you get to uh, the singers, uh, the Levites, rather, in chapter in verse 40, uh, the Levites that are, that are there, again... Uh, Jeshua's mentioned he would be the high priest at that time, or Joshua is mentioned there. Um, but then in verse 40, oh, and you have 128 singers huh, that, are, that are listed there. Children In verse 41, it mentions children of Asaph. I always like the writers of the Psalms. They're mentioned here. You know, we forget that God knows each of these names. He knows not only their names, but what they were like. And, and just like he, he names the stars and numbers the stars. Um, it's amazing. The Nethanims. Uh, <laughs> the Nethanims, you might jot down. Who are the Nethanims in verse 43? Ezra 2, 43. In, in the ninth chapter of the book of Joshua, you may remember Joshua comes up and, and he's tricked by these guys who come and remember they make their faces look like they've been starving. They have bread that they've made to, to seem stale and hard. And they trick Joshua into making a uh, peace treaty with 
these guys that end up being the enemy, the Gibeonites. And after they find out, after Joshua finds out they tricked him, um, he, he makes these guys, and they become the Nethanims. He causes them to carry the wood and the water for the temple, which we're going to get into. Um, there's three phases I forgot to mention when we started, when you start the book of Ezra. There's three phases here that we're going to look, get into, look into. And number one is Zerubbabel um, rebuilding the temple. That's number one. Then that's, I didn't write down here chapters, <laughs> divisions, but uh, I thought I did. Yeah, Zerubbabel and the construction of the temple. Uh, chapters 1 through 6 of Ezra. And then chapters 7 through 10 through the end is Ezra and instructions, and he's rebuilding the people. <laughs> Ezra is instruction. Zerubbabel, which we'll be looking at more of, chapters 1 through 6 of Ezra. Zerubbabel is the construction of the temple, rebuilding the temple. And so... These guys are all helpers in the temple. And the Nethanims would start out as enemies and would start to, uh, or, or strangers, I should say, and started out tricking Joshua and, and kind of weaseling their way in. Now they find themselves in the work of the ministry. And another, I liked the uh, correlation that Corson, John Corson, uh, put there with with these guys, the Gibeonites, who end up becoming the Nethanims, uh, is uh, Simon the Cyrene. He's he's found when Jesus is struggling with his cross. It's Simon, this this uh, Cyrene, who would have been a black guy from. From a different area, totally different part of the of the uh, area there, who's told carry the wood, and it's it's a really kind of a neat uh, thing because that guy Simon the Cyrene goes on, and in the New Testament, in the Book of Acts, I think it is, we find his children as leaders in the church, a lot like the Nethanims here. They're here, they are b building and being a part of the rebuilding project of the temple. Maybe you didn't find it fascinating. I did, okay? <laughs> Don't laugh. No. So Mordecai, it says, was not the same no, famous Mordecai. It's not that guy, okay. That's it's not good. Of the same name. That's not Mordecai of, uh, no. of Esther. So, good. We got clarity on that. <laughs> um. So that's Joshua 9, verse 23, where he says, carry the wood and carry the water. Um, and you will be those who do that. Then you get to the children of Solomon. <clears throat> Solomon and his glory and his temple. And verse 55, Ezra 2, 55. We're just jamming right along here. Oh. And uh, you go down to about verse 62. Yeah, in verse 62, these sought their registered among those that were reckoned by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, were they as polluted put from the priesthood. Um, these guys would come and kind of uh, say, we're, we are priests. We are of the priesthood. We're in the family. Mm -hmm. And, and their names were not found. <laughs> uh, their their uh, genealogy was not found, verse 61 and 62. Um, and I just had to write the Lamb's Book of Life. These guys couldn't prove that their names were written in whatever book, the, the book of the genealogy. Do you know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? <coughs> can't be uncertain about that. You cannot be um, up in the air about it. Do you know it's a real book? You got to know and be sure that this 
<laughs> this ain't something like the priesthood. This is eternity. But these guys would come and try to prove it. <laughs> if, if you're not, if your name's not in the book, you can't serve. You can't be in the family. Um, when is, uh, well, <laughs> there's a whole other study there, isn't there? <laughs> but, but the book of life, um, I just thought that was a neat thing. And then the Tershatha said unto them uh, that they should, verse 63, Ezra 2, 63, that they should not, these same guys who kind of uh, want to be priests that aren't proven to be, they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest or a high priest with Urim and with Thummim. And the whole congregation together was 42,303 score. Um, so the high priest, and, and this is another important thing to, to kind of see the correlation in verse 63. Don't eat of the most holy things don't do anything until the high priest comes. And Urim and Thummim, um, people kind of try and, in fact, people get in trouble uh, trying to describe it. Good old Joe Smith, Joseph Smith of the Mormon Church, uh, took this Urim and Thummim, and he says that they're special magical pairs of glasses that cause you to see things that... that and, and he used, and people believe it, they eat it right up. Careful of that. The word Urim and the word Thummim simply means and is interpreted lights and perfection. And again, I got to give John Corson credit for this one. Who is light? Who is perfection? More than that, who is the great high priest <laughs> Jesus Christ and he's I think if anybody I, I've heard it more and more I've heard it from him you will find Jesus in every chapter of the Bible <laughs> you just gotta look and and like like that don't do anything don't eat anything don't make a move and tell Jesus until you check in with lights and perfection until you Look to the high priest, the great high priest. And and, I, to say, uh, with David, I think it was David, when he went into the, uh, the temple and he ate the showbread and stuff like that. Yeah, that with, was well that was just his boys were hungry. And, and that was practicality over legal, legality, where God provided for David and his men, even though they... And Jesus pointed that out, that they had broken their rules. They shouldn't have eaten the showbread, but God provided for them. So that's, that's kind of a whole other subject. But yeah, where Jesus, where uh, love, <laughs> love and the... Uh, That life is precious in his sight, more precious than breaking a Sabbath rule. And that, that was Jesus' point in, in bringing that up. Because what they were getting upset that he was healing. Here's a guy that's lame, that hasn't been able to walk his whole life, and all they can talk about is, you broke the Sabbath rule. Listen, when David and his men were hungry, on the verge of death, possibly, they went into the 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 pre the uh, temple there and took of the showbread. That wasn't legal. They weren't right. Uh, they broke the law doing that. But because of the the uh, grace. because of grace and because of God sees the value of life as much more precious than the law that, that of man, especially traditions of man. You know, and it's yeah that whole thing of law and grace and how it's it's truly uh, he's the perfect example of that. Wow, we got way off topic, didn't we? <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's good. 
the Urim and the Thummim just point us to Jesus Christ. Again, the high priest. Uh, besides their servants and their maids of whom they were, uh, this is verse 65, there was 337, uh, and there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. Their horses were 700, and their camels, and their, uh, I think it's something like 8,000, I thought I wrote down the, 8,136 animals, if you add them, tally them up. Um, and some of the chief priests of the, uh, or some of the chief of the fathers, verse 68, Ezra 2, 68, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set it up in his place. They gave after their ability unto the, uh, unto the treasure of the work uh, 61,000 drams of gold and 5,000 pound of silver and 100 priest's garments. So the priest and the Levites... And some of the people and the singers and the poor porters or the gatekeepers and those Nethanims <laughs> dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities. You might jot down uh, Second, Chron uh, Second Corinthians nine seven. God loves a cheerful giver. These guys were not. Uh, they didn't beg them to give. Um, it was just given out of out of their what their their ability. Verse sixty eight, right? Or sixty nine. It was what they were able to give. God's not looking for ability, but a availability that you would just be available, and and that whatever you're able to do it doesn't have to be uh, fantastic. It doesn't have to be. Um, talented or or you don't have to worry about any of that god's just looking for workers that'll give that'll that'll be faithful in the little things <coughs> quickly chapter three when the seventh month was come and the children of israel were in the cities the people gathered themselves together as one man they're unified to jerusalem then stood up Joshua, the son of Je that guy, Jazadak, <laughs> and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of uh, that guy, Shaltel, and his brethren, and built build, the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Verse 3, And they set the altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them all because of the people of those countries, and they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the feast of the tabernacles, uh, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the, duties, as the duty of every day required. Verse 5, and afterward offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feast of the Lord that were consecrated and of everyone that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord wasn't even was not yet laid. <laughs> and they gave money also unto the masons and unto the carpenters to, and meat and drink and oil unto the, them of Zidon and of Tyre, Sidon and, and Tyre, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia, now in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of that guy, and Joshua, the son of that guy, Jozadak, uh, and the remnant of their brethren, the priest and the Levites, and all, that they, all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem. 
and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Joshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmel and his sons, and the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priest in their apparel with trumpets. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, there they are, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the 